Hello everyone. Guess what we're talking about today? Creativity. So creativity is a big deal in my life. It's something that is so sacred to me. It's something that brings me so much joy. It's something that is really complicated and complex. And today I'm gonna to be talking about starting a creative path since I have been on a creative path my entire life. And more specifically in the last 10 years, I have had a creative career. I went onto Instagram and asked you guys about your questions when it came to navigating a creative career. And so many questions came in. Christina and I were like, oh my God, we literally have a document with only some of the questions and it's like pages long. What I'm thinking is I'm gonna turn this into a series so I can touch on the major themes that came up in your questions. And one thing that kept coming up was questions around how to begin. Now, I know that there are tons of different creative paths. There are a lot of different creative careers and everyone is going to have a different experience because of that. So this video is really based off of my personal experience with creativity and my professional experience over the last decade. Okay, so let's start with your questions. How do you know what's good or worth pursuing? And how do you know which creative career is best? A lot of times I feel like we go from, I have this idea to how do I make this my full-time career or how do I become a master at this thing? And we don't think about all of the steps in between. The various and varied steps in between. What I have learned is that no one becomes a seasoned artist overnight. And that in order to achieve the big and seemingly impossible, we have to focus on the small and possible things that are right in front of us. I have felt this so many times where I have a small idea that is just budding and I immediately take it from like A all the way to Z and then I freak myself out and then I'm like, well, this is impossible, I can't do it and then I give up. What I've learned is that's not how the process works and there's so many small increments in between and those small steps are often where I learn the most, not only about the work that I'm doing, but about myself. And when I allow those steps to be my guide, I'm always led in the direction that I'm supposed to go in. I've also had the experience of having an idea or enjoying something and then immediately going into, how do I turn this into a paid job? Now I'm more interested in exploring different things and having that private space to explore my creativity and things that I'm testing out. And then I decide, okay, maybe this is something that I wanna bring into the paid ring of work that I'm doing. And sometimes I decide this is actually something that I want to keep for myself and I don't wanna be paid for it. And both of those things are okay. And I think that it is actually really essential to have that private space of creativity where you're not getting paid for certain work, where it's just for yourself and it's solely enriching for your creative being. I've learned that a lot of times it's really about the pursuit and the process and less about what the outcome is going to be. We might discover a creative outlet that we do want to get paid for. We might discover that it's a creative outlet we don't want to get paid for. We might discover a whole new surprising set of skills along the way and decide to take another path. We can also experience disappointment if things don't work out the way that we had hoped or imagined. In these moments, I tell myself that it's the end of a process, but it's not the end of myself as a person or my creativity. It's just the end of this process and this project, and there's something else that will always, always come afterwards. It's never the end of you as a person. Now, when it comes to deciding what to pursue, because there are a lot of options, what I've heard over the years over and over is, 
follow your passion, follow what you enjoy, do what you love. And I think it's so much more than just what you enjoy because there can be a lot of things that we enjoy and that can make it really hard to determine what to choose when you're like, well, I really like five different things. I really like 10 different things. Where do I begin? There are also lots of things that we can enjoy that we don't really want to turn into a career or into paid work. And I've had that experience with cooking. Cooking is something that I have always really loved. I have been in the kitchen since I was really young. I would make like little concoctions in the kitchen. I've always just loved playing in the kitchen. And when I started making YouTube videos, it felt like I should share what I'm making in the kitchen because it was something that I really loved but as I actually stepped into that space I realized that I didn't like it I didn't like turning something that had always been really personal that I found to be a really private and creative space into something that was public and then there was pressure on it and then there was pressure to make money off of it and then there was pressure to like come up with more and better and I didn't want that anymore and so if you have been watching my videos for a while you have probably noticed that I have pulled back from making cooking videos and that's because I needed that space for myself again and there are a few exceptions that I'll make here and there but generally I keep the space of cooking and baking and just being in the kitchen for myself and that has been so enriching for me and then it allows me to focus on the things that I do want to make money from that I do like making money from um, so I think that's an example of really deeply loving something but also realizing that making money off of it wasn't the right call for me something that has been more helpful for me in terms of deciding you know what to pursue is less so thinking about what it is that I enjoy and more so tapping in to the things that just won't leave me alone. I think all of us have ideas, at least one of them, that is so persistent and pesky, it keeps popping up inside of us. It could be over the course of years sometimes. And this idea or ideas keep popping up despite people telling us that we can never turn it into a career that we'll never be able to make money off of it that we won't be good enough etc etc the idea keeps coming back i think that is the thing worth paying attention to the thing that won't leave you alone i think that's the thing that we need to listen to next question i'm 24 is it too late to start a creative career this is something that really hit home for me because a consistent just like negative thought that has come up for me for, I don't know, since I was a teenager has been, it's too late to start. And so this one feels really personal to me because I know what it feels like. My answer to the is it too late question is no. No, 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 period. I think it is so easy to look at the world around us that celebrates creativity often through the lens of youth and feel like we are not good enough, that we're too old, that it's too late, there's no hope for us, so what's the point in even starting? It can also feel like we've missed our chance and that our best days are behind us. And that is just a lie. It is 100% a pure lie. And I think when we learn to see it as a lie, it helps us to move past that point. And I think the important thing to remember here is that it will always be a lie, no matter how old you are. It doesn't matter if you're 18, if you're 24, if you're 31, if you're 55, if you're 60, if you're 70, if you're 90, it will always, always be a lie. And I have seen this from my perspective and I have seen it from people in my life who are older and who have started something new at an age where so many people would tell Tell them, no, it's too late, and they've done it anyway. All of us are going to go through multiple new beginnings, whether it's in our personal lives 
or our professional lives or our creative lives. It's just a fact of life. We're gonna have these starts over and over and over and over. I think when we're able to recognize starting as part of a larger process and not an end all be all, it makes it a little bit easier to begin. Next question. How do we know if our skills are strong enough? The key here is remembering that we don't need to start as experts, as masters, as geniuses, as know-it-alls. I think it's actually better to not start that way. For me, the best part of starting is that I get to be bad at something. I get to make mistakes. I get to play around. I get to see what works. I get to see what doesn't work. That is so exciting to me. Like when I started making YouTube videos, I was bad at everything. I didn't know how to do makeup. I didn't know how to operate like a laptop beyond just like going online. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to manage a business. I didn't know how to do all of these things. I was bad at all of the things that are major components of my now career. And so if I had told myself at the beginning that I couldn't begin because I didn't know how to do these things, I never would have started. Also, I wanna throw in there, I was bad at being in front of a camera too. That's like a major component of what I do. So yeah, I, I let myself be bad at all of these things. And when you're bad at something enough, usually, you get a little better at it when you just let yourself have that process over and over again. I think there's so much pressure and seriousness around the idea of being good, the idea of it, and there's so much play and whimsy in the actual act of being bad. And I think that is the beauty of being bad, is that there's so much exploration, there's so much whimsy, there's so much lightness in the act of being bad, and the idea of being good is serious and is all about perfection and really is just a ton of pressure. I think this is about letting go of the need to be good, whatever that means, because that's an idea that we have created, letting go of the idea of being good right out of the gates and allowing ourselves to show up and do the work we know we need to do. Next up, how did you decide when to leave your backup job to pursue your creative career full time? Okay, so first off, this really depends on how much risk you're willing to take on, and I cannot determine that for you. But I can tell you about where I started. When I started, I was 20 years old, I had over $30,000 in debt, and I had a part-time job where I was making about $300 a month. So having that picture painted, I can see reflectively now that money wasn't something that I was afraid of losing because I really didn't have that much to lose. So that wasn't a major factor for me. If anything, I was like, I think I can only gain from here because I have a lot of debt. So as long as I just don't get myself into more debt, I can just gain, even if it's in small increments. So that's kind of like where I was coming from in that sense. Also, I was 20 years old and no one else's well-being depended on my YouTube path and if it ended up going somewhere. I also didn't have a backup plan. If I were to rewind, 20-year-old Ingrid would have said, we do have a backup plan, but I really didn't. If I'm being honest, I had zero plan. Like I maybe had a vague idea, but I really didn't think about it or think it through. So I consider that as no plan. I was in this position where the one thing that I knew was that this thing, this making of the videos would not leave me alone and I wanted to pursue it and I wanted to see what would happen. And if it led to a dead end, then I would figure it out from there. And that's where I, was coming from. Now at 31 years old in this new season of starting, things are a little different for me. It's not exactly the same as it was when I was 20. 
It doesn't mean that I'm not starting, but there are more and different things to consider. First of all, I not only financially support myself, but I also financially support my mom. So that is a factor that didn't exist before. I also really love making content online, especially right now. I feel like I've gone through a whole journey with making things online and I'm in this place where I really love it. I've like dug into a new layer of love for it. And I'm also just really happy when I'm making things and I don't want to stop doing that. It doesn't make sense for me. It's not something that I want to do. So what I'm doing now is I'm exploring new things and new ways to be creative alongside things that are familiar to me. And that's what feels right to me right now. And so you can see that it is different from when I was 20, but something that is still similar is that when I was 20, I had that part-time job and I was still doing that part-time job alongside making YouTube videos. And so my financial circumstances have changed vastly in the last decade, but something that is still really similar in terms of like this starting for me is that I am doing new things alongside something that is familiar. I will say I love the familiar to me now in comparison to that part-time job. Like I didn't love that part-time job. So that's a big difference too. But the, you know, doing things alongside each other, I feel like that is just so me. That feels right for me. Speaking of part-time jobs, the next question is all about that. Do you recommend trying to do your creative career part-time at first? Again, this answer, like every answer is going to be different for everyone because everybody is pursuing something different. Everyone is coming from different financial circumstances. Everyone is coming from different personal circumstances. From my experience, when I started making YouTube videos, I couldn't quit my part-time job. So I was making about $300 a month and that was income that I really needed. And I couldn't just stop that to make YouTube videos, especially because I wasn't making money off of YouTube videos, especially in the first year. When I think back to that time, I really didn't know if I would ever make money off of my videos. I just knew that I had to keep going. That's all that I knew for sure. And I also knew that I couldn't quit my part-time job. So two things for sure. And I think at that time, it was really, really good for me to have exposure to those two worlds. Because when I would physically go into work, I would be surrounded by other people with other personalities. I was connected to the world around me. But then, you know, if something frustrating at work happened, I was able to work through those feelings and process them them through my creative work, which was making YouTube videos. So the two worlds were really different, but I found a way to make them work together. Next question. How do you get over the anxiety of putting your art out there? In my case, photography. For me, it's not about getting over the anxiety. It's about acknowledging when the anxiety arrives because I don't think that I'm just like ever gonna completely get rid of it. So the best that I can do is acknowledge when it is at my doorstep. And then I tell myself that putting my work out into the world is an essential part of the creative process. It is so, so important. What I've learned is my anxiety will actually get way worse if I don't put my work out into the world. It will actually accumulate over time because I'm not giving myself the release that I need. You know, this part of the creative process is the last step and for me, it is one of the most important steps. It is the last step within my control because once you put something out into the world, it's not within your control anymore and the outcome is really not your job. 
This space is so many things. It is exhilarating, it is nerve wracking, it is beautiful, it is incredibly personal, it is mysterious. It feels like you're on the cusp of possibility. And for me, this is the part of the creative process that often makes me feel like I am most in touch with who I am as a human being because I'm experiencing all of these emotions at once and I've taken all of these steps and I've reached this point and I'm about to put it out into the world and it is just so intimate to me. When we deny ourselves a release, especially because of baseless, critical thoughts that may be creeping in, we stifle our creativity. Creativity is something that lives and breathes by being shared with other people, not through perfectionism. And so when I remember that, I remember that this is something that I have to do. It is a gift that I have to give myself. And it is so, Worth it. How do you stop doubt from creeping in when pursuing a creative career? The really insidious thing about doubts is that they appear in our minds as fact and they are not. They are lies. Repeat that. They are lies. Doubts are lies. They are not fact. They are not based in evidence. They are based often in perfectionism and lies that other people have told us about ourselves. And the thing about lies is that they may be loud, but they crack under the light of truth. And truth is often quiet, but it is expansive and it is infinite and it is bright. And when you shine a light on lies with truth, they have nowhere to hide anymore. And so the way that we do that is by acknowledging our deeper truths. So to get to our deeper truths, I have an exercise. So this is actually something that um, if you're familiar with the artist way that you do pretty early on in the artist way, it's like one of the first activities. And I have kind of like adopted it into my own life. I've done it multiple times and I found it to be really helpful. And so essentially what you do is you need a piece of paper and a pen. You get in touch with your lies and usually those are things that come pretty easily. Like I'm always like, oh, you want me to get in touch with all the negative things I think about myself? Cool, I can tap into that fountain real fast. It's just like press a button and here we go. So I find that part to be pretty easy. And the way that you do this is you write the lies as they come out. And I have noticed that it can get increasingly painful and harder as you go, especially as you like really allow them to come out. And so just know when you do this exercise, it will feel very personal and very vicious. Those lies are gonna feel really just like they're not letting go. But remember that they are loud and that they actually don't take up that much space and that we're going to dissolve them. After you have your list of lies, then what you wanna do is create your list of truths. So the way that I create my list of truths is by writing the exact opposite of the lie. So a lie that is pretty consistent for me is that it is too late. And so my truth around that is it is never too late. You only get better with age. You have so much to give. Your creative energy is not dead. It only grows as you grow. It only gets better as you get older. And so that would be my truth to combat it's too late. And so you, you do that for every one of your lies. Now, something that I recommend doing that isn't um, in the artist way is sharing this with at least one other person. And it is very important to be extremely discerning with who this person is. It has to be someone that you really trust who you know is going to be a cheerleader for you who has earned the right to be in a vulnerable space with you so if you can't think of someone then do this with yourself but this can be 
really cathartic to do it with somebody else. And I have done this with other people before and it is extremely vulnerable. It is extremely emotional, but that's kind of the point. Essentially, when you write your column of truths, those become affirmations for you and they are completely customized to what your specific lies are about yourself, your specific doubts about yourself. So this is really helpful for me because I'm someone who can't just like shout out random affirmations and then believe it because I don't see the personal tie to myself, but this allows me to see the personal tie. And something that I've done on my own is kind of taken it to another step, which is with the truths, allowing myself to pick a piece of evidence from my life to back up that truth. And that makes the truth even more powerful. And so with the it's too late lie and my truth, I can pick literally just in this last year, being 30 years old and how much I learned in that last year and how much my creativity expanded in that last year, how many difficult things I did in the last year and I worked through them and I wouldn't have been able to do that when I was younger. I was only able to do it at that point in my life and at that point in my life, I was older. And so that is like a point of evidence for me. And I think that can be really valuable to have those anchors of evidence from your life to back up those truths even more. And I think one of the reasons why this process can be so incredibly emotional is not only are you digging into like this deep well of horrible things that you think about yourself, but you're also acknowledging the powerful truths. And I often find that I end up getting the most emotional when I read my truths because I know they are true. I know deep down they are true, but I don't let myself see that truth as often as I should. As I've done this over and over, I've memorized what those truths and affirmations are. And so when the thought of it's too late comes into my head, I know immediately what is going to shine a light on that and make that lie shatter. So we have reached the end of this video. You know, I think so much of this work is about generosity when it comes to self allowance, allowing ourselves to be creative, allowing ourselves to start, allowing ourselves to play, allowing ourselves to be bad, allowing ourselves to trust our instincts. I think we all have the capacity for all of those things. So next time I am going to be talking about another topic that came up in your questions and that topic was money as it relates to creativity, pursuing a creative career and being on a creative path. This is something that I'm really looking forward to digging into because Money, as we know, is really complex. And when it comes to being on a creative path, there are so many things to consider. There are the logistical components, but then there's also a really heavy emotional side. And often we can find that money challenges our integrity and our instincts. So how do we make money and still honor who we are? That's what I'm gonna be talking about next time. But I hope this time you found something helpful from this video. Please let me know what you think in the comments down below. And if you have any questions for me, if you have something that you would like me to talk about in the money video, please leave a comment down below. I am thinking of turning this into a series because I think there's so much to talk about when it comes to creativity and pursuing a creative path. And if you wanna turn that into a creative career, there is so much. And I really saw that even more when I saw your questions coming in. Leave the comments down below. They definitely help to fuel and structure things that are to come. So until next time, I hope you all are having a wonderful day and I hope you take a moment to really nurture the creative part of yourself. Do one thing today to nurture the creative part of yourself, even if it's something 
really, really small. Take care of that part of yourself because it is precious, it is sacred, and it is what makes life so vibrant and beautiful. I will see you guys next time. Bye.